So it's my pleasure to end your day here um, and get you off to cocktails, but uh, I'm, I'm happy to tell you about Biosite. We're a San Diego-based company, and I only have about five minutes to convince you we are a leading company in the regenerative medicine cell therapy space. Um, so I'll try to do that fairly quickly. So Biosite is focused and has been focused for over a decade. The company's been around for, for more than 10 years. We actually merged a division of J&J &J into Viasite two years ago that had also worked in this field for about 10 years. Um, and uh, we have been focused during that time on delivering a functional cure for patients with type 1 diabetes. A cure for type 1, we also believe it could be a treatment for type 2. And the, way, the reason we had chose type 1 at this, the technology is broadly applicable for a lot of different diseases, but type 1 makes a lot of sense. Type 1 is an autoimmune disease where you lose the beta cells. A uh, hundred years ago, type 1 was a fatal disease, and insulin turned it into a chronic disease. So if we can replace those beta cells that are lost to disease, you can potentially cure the, product, the, the patient. So it makes it a very good target for cell replacement therapy. What we're developing is a stem cell derived islet replacement therapy. So we start with a stem cell starting point, we drive them up to a pancreatic cell during manufacture and then we implant it. Gives a very straightforward clinical endpoints. When we enroll patients into studies, they come in without the ability to produce any insulin on their own, what's called C peptide negative. If they're now producing C peptide after we treat them, your product is working. So it's a yes or no answer. And importantly, as was mentioned in the last talk, it's already been demonstrated that you can cure patients with type 1 diabetes by replacing the islet tissue that, that is dysfunctional, the beta cells that produce the insulin that are lost to the disease. And this was shown under what's commonly called the Edmonton Protocol up in Canada about 18 years ago. And there are patients walking around today that received cadaver islet cells 18 years ago that are still completely insulin independent and essentially cured. The problem with that is there's a very limited supply of, of islets to do that with. Um, in the U.S., there's only about 1,500 pancreases available per year. And as was mentioned earlier, you can take two, even three pancreases to get enough cells to treat a single patient. Um, so we believe we can make an unlimited source. We can do it effectively, cost-effectively, and treat essentially all patients with this disease. So basically in type 1, what's shown here is taking, is shown as a month worth of supplies for a type 1 patient. Not only is type 1 a disease that causes long-term complications, a loss of about a decade of life, it also is a, a big lifestyle and, and quality of life issue. And we're converting that to essentially implanting a device containing these these cells, these islet cells derived from stem cells, and they will continue to mature after we put them into the patient and become essentially normal islet tissue under the skin, producing insulin, glucagon, somatostatin, the full complement of islet cells. The manufacturing process of this, we start with a stem cell line called Site49 that we isolated uh, a number of years ago. It's been thoroughly tested. It's probably one of the most tested stem cell lines in existence. It's been reviewed by regulators at the FDA, Health Canada, in Europe, and been given the green light as a starting material for manufacturing. Gives us an unlimited source of cells. We then go through a process of scaling that up, the scaling those cells up from millions of cells to billions of cells, and then we go through a directed differentiation that's about a two-week process to drive it. That two-week process took about eight years to, to produce, um, and we have uh, about eight, 700 patents in the field right now uh, between us and the J&J &J patent portfolio that we got from them. So once we make those cells, we can freeze them down. When we're ready to treat a patient, we can take a vial out of the freezer, thaw it, and put it into a device. Think of it like a tea bag like device that goes under the skin. Those cells differentiate and pot potentially provide that cure. We have two products. What's really important in human cell therapy is you have to get to the clinic to really understand what you have. Um, the animal studies can tell you a lot 
but not, they're not going to give you what you really need to know in order to optimize your products and make sure they're maximally effective in patients. So we have two products. The first generation is an open device. It's similar to the cadaver eyelet transplant approach. It allows direct vascularization of cells, but it requires immune suppression. So it's only suitable for the high-risk patient population, about 10% of type 1 diabetics, um, that are, would be willing to take that immune suppression in order to uh, cure this disease. Uh, we're excited about that product, but what we're really excited about is the second generation product, which is a fully encapsulated product where there's a semi-permeable membrane on that tea bag, if you will, that allows the free flow of oxygen, nutrients, even proteins across that membrane, but blocks any cell-cell interaction. And by that, doing that, we prevent any adaptive immune system reaction to our cells and prevent the allogeneic and autoimmune rejection. We've shown that now in the clinic. So it is a more challenging product because you've got to get a vascular network set up on the surface of that device and so susceptible to what's called a foreign body response. And that's what we needed to learn about getting into the clinic. So we actually put this clinic in, this product in the clinic first as a subtherapeutic dose while we got PEC Direct ready, knowing that we were going to see a foreign body response, but we needed to know how aggressive that was going to be. So both of these have been in phase one, two trial. This is just some uh, clinical findings to date. Um, with PEC Direct, it appears to be safe and well tolerated. We've shown that we get uh, robust tissue integration, that direct vascularization happens very well, at least in the early stages of this. We're only up to about four weeks with these patients. Um, and we're continuing that optimization. We expect efficacy results in about uh, the six to 12 month time frame. PEC and CAP, we did the, the initial evaluation of that. We showed it was safe and well tolerated. We showed that the cells were protected against the adaptive immune system, so the Encaptera cell delivery device was doing its job. We also showed that we could get maturation of the cells similar to what we saw in the animal models. However, we did see a pretty robust foreign body response that was limiting the engraftment. So we have stepped back from that trial, we're paused it at the moment, and we're working with the world's leading company on the material that we use for that membrane, WL Gore. The membrane is essentially Gore-Tex. It's a medical grade plastic, expanded PTFE. So we're working with Gore. They have the ability to, to engineer that, that membrane in many different ways. We've studied a whole bunch of different uh, devices. We've now selected a new membrane material and are expecting to resume that clinical trial early next year. So I think I'm going to stop there and uh, let you ask me some questions. So um, this is actually a good slide because I would love to chat a little bit more about the ongoing clinical trial, if you can talk a little bit more about um, the, the progress that's being made there. Um, number of patients, things along those lines. And I guess most importantly for me and probably the audience is um, how should we be thinking about the timeline of uh, both these products and uh, potential regulatory strategy going forward? Sure. So I'll start with the regulatory strategy. So they're both being regulated as biologics. Um, they are combination products, so there is a consult from the um, agency with the device group. But um, the interesting thing on PEC Direct and PEC and CAP, as I said, the first one we put in the clinic was PEC and CAP. Um, obviously, if PEC and CAP worked uh, perfectly right off the get-go, we would not necessarily need PEC Direct. Okay, if because we could use potentially PEC direct with all the patients, or sorry, PEC and CAP with all the patients. So we put that in the clinic first to see what that foreign body response was, and once we saw that we did need to do some more work, we moved forward with PEC direct. So in terms of answer your question, on terms of the trial, PEC direct it's in this high risk patient population. We had a Type C meeting with the FDA at the end of last year in November to discuss getting an RMAT designation for PEC direct. We believe as few as eight to ten patients are all we'll need to show efficacy on to get that RMAT designation. You can power this study to show proof efficacy with as few as 40 patients because the endpoint is so clear. Um, and based on our discussion with the agency, we think as few as a total exposure of about 100 to 150 patients, which would, would be what's necessary. So assuming everything stays on track, we think in the next couple years, we could have that ready to go to a, a BLA filing with an RMAT designation. PEC and CAP. 
Um, we did 19 patients in this trial to date, all at subtherapeutic doses. Um, we use that to understand that foreign body response. We've now shown, and we also use that to validate an animal model that's predictive for that human study. And so we've now shown in that animal model that we have materials from Gore that are now very effective, as effective as in the, the mouse model where, pe where all, both products work very effectively. Uh, and so we're, we're now gearing up to move that product back into the clinic and resume the phase one, two clinical trial. The IND remains open, the, the protocol remains open, um, so it's a matter of putting in an amendment to use this new membrane material and then restart that trial. So we hope to have that started in uh, around the first half of next year and then be into the phase two portion of that trial. So can you just tell me a little bit more about, I guess, the difference between PEC and CAP and PEC Direct and, and why, you know, why the two different indications? Right. So PEC Direct, they both deliver the same cells. The same, the cell therapy is exactly the same, okay? It, they differ in the device. And the real difference between the devices, as it's shown on this slide, is that that membrane on the PEC Direct has ports that are engineered into it. So we've essentially opened it up, if you will, okay? So it's kind of an open architecture that allows that direct vascularization so those vessels can move through that membrane and into the lumen of the device. The cells themselves are pancreatic progenitors when we put them in, so they're at a stage where they're recruiting that vascular network into the device. The advantage of that is it is not affected by a foreign body response. You still get a foreign body response just as much as you do with PEC and CAP, but because the direct vascularization there, it has no impact on the cells inside. So that's, that makes it a very robust product, but of course it has to be used with immune suppression because of that open, open nature of it. So we're, while we're excited about that, we think there's a, a very substantial commercial opportunity there. We are working very uh, aggressively on PEC and CAP to bring that one back into the clinic and resume clinical development on that. We know that uh, it can work. We know from cadaver islets that you can cure type 1 diabetes with a, an islet transplant. We know that we can produce normal human islet tissue from our stem cell starting point. We know that can occur in patients. We showed that in with PEC and CAP, even though we didn't get the type of engraftment we want, we did see engraftment in certain regions of the devices and in certain patients. And when we got that, the cells differentiated and became islet tissue under the skin. So we know that can work. Um, and we know that the device will protect it against the immune system. So we've got all of the elements in place. We know we, we don't have to invent anything new to cure this disease. It's now an engineering problem, which is what we've been working with W.L. Gore on, the world's expert in this material, to overcome that engineering issue and uh, provide a, a product that now can be very effective in these patients. And based on the preclinical data that we now have that we can compare to the clinical data, we think we're there. So we're, we're pretty confident that once we get PEC and CAP back in the clinic, we'll have an effective treatment. You're a mind reader because you answered my third question, so I'm going to ask you about collaborations. Um, you know, there, there are obviously different types of uh, partnerships. You know, what are you, what are you thinking about in terms of uh, potential collaborations and partnerships? And I think you guys also had a lot of support from patient advocacy groups, and that brings a different angle. Um, yeah. So maybe just uh, uh, we end on. Actually, that. put a slide in on that. So, yeah. So. Um, we're a venture capital finance company, uh, so about 80 million of our funding over the last decade has come from the venture capital community. Our single largest investor is Johnson & Johnson. Um, they own about 25% or so of us, um, so they've been big supporters of us. As I mentioned, we did consolidate their beta logic division into Viasite in 2016. Um, but we're also really proud of the fact that we have had really strong support from advocacy groups. So the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine, uh, JDRF, um, the largest organization focused on type 1, beyond type 1, a small grant from them, Horizon 2020 in, in Europe, have all provided non-dilutive funding to the program in the totaling almost $100 million. So we've actually gotten more from the advocacy groups than we have from the venture groups at this stage. 
of course, we're now in the clinical studies, so the expenses go up, and and uh, you know that our focus changes a little bit. Great. Well, I think Paul and I are both very cognizant of the fact that we're all that remain between you and a fine glass of Chardonnay. So I'd like to thank you all for your time, and uh, I hope you had a great conference. Thank you. Thank you. Paul.